Welcome to the second programme in our little wine drinking series. Now, if you were confused last week, there's no excuse this week. You should have your Puyfrime and your Vouvray. And if you haven't, I'll just drink on my own. <laughs> This week we're in the Loire Valley. We'll find out how white wine is actually made. We'll be discussing vintages, what are they and why. And of course, I'll be cooking something strange and tasting some very nice white wines. The Loire is an enormous region of northwest France, stretching from the Atlantic to virtually the middle of the country, following the course of the Loire River itself, all 620 miles of it. A source of some wonderful freshwater fish, by the way. In the western parts of the Loire, you find the well-known Rose d'Anjou, and as you move east, the wine production becomes predominantly white, producing such well-known wines as Muscadet, Sancerre, and of course, the two will be tasting Vouvray and Puy Fumé. It's a region that was frequently visited by the kings and queens of France, giving it the name Valley of the Kings. Along the banks of the river and throughout the region, you can find some of the most impressive chateaux in all of France. I think my own personal favourite was Aisy le Ridou, a small but charming chateau just west of Tours. As a matter of fact, I think it would make an ideal location for our first tasting. So, course is ready, let's join up with our master of wine, Jonathan Pedley. It's a fabulous place, but unfortunately, to make ends meet, we've had to let in the public. Anyway, we're not here gazing at chateaus, we're here to taste some wine. Vouvray, I hope you've got yours, with our master of wine, Jonathan Pedley. Here, we're attempting to characterize the flavors of well-known wines, so it doesn't really matter who actually produced your Vouvray, as long as you've got one. Yes, that's right. We're just trying to give people a general feel for the, the style of wine. Anyway, I shall not keep you waiting any longer. Vouvray is the first of our Loire white wines, and it's made from a grape variety called the Chenin Blanc. And if you remember, that obviously is a bit of a contrast from last week with our first white wine, the Chablis which of course is made from the Chardonnay grape. So this is really our first chance to contrast not just a different region, but a different grape. So it should be, um, should be quite interesting. Anyway, here we go. I hope you're uncorked. Glass is ready. Chilled wine, very important. Now, a bit of revision from last week. Revision? <laughs> I don't want to do revision. <laughs> Now, if you remember, the first thing always when you're tasting a wine is to have a quick look at the appearance. And you remember, just check that it's clear and bright, make mm -hmm. sure there's nothing alive and wandering around in there. Some description of the depth of the colour. Well, and this is incredibly pale. It's sort of a lime, pale lime coloured. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at that, it's a very, very light colour, almost a watery colour. Now, there are many, many reasons why a wine is one colour and not another. But one thing to watch out for is in a cool climate like the Loire, you tend to find the white ones tend to be comparatively pale in colour, whereas in a warmer climate, you tend to get richer, deeper colours. Yellower, strawy sort of colours. Exactly, yeah. more golden colours. Now, the crucial bit then on the smell, if we have a quick Still swirl. very difficult, isn't it, doing this twizzling business? <laughs> you don't have to twizzle at home if you don't want to. You probably have, you've probably drunk it all already. I'm sure you've perfected it by the end of our travels. <laughs> um, now, on the smell, and if you remember, that's always very, very important first thing to check is that just like checking the appearance, if the wine is clean and fresh, we know it's probably okay. There's unlike to be any problem with the wine. And it's what's very sort of, crispy. Yes, it's, it's nice and crisp and fresh. And again, this is the cool climate. I always think with wine, you can almost smell that this smells cool and crisp and fresh. It's a cool climate wine. Whereas if we had a, say, a Chardonnay from Australia, you get a big, rich flavour. It smells if it's come from a warm place. And to me, with Chenin, you tend to get fruits like sort of green apple or pears. It's a lovely, crisp smell. Do you find that, apples and pears? Yeah, we're climbing up them right now, they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it, it is rather, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely smell when, it, when, it, when it's working. No, it is, it's good, this is excellent. Now, on the taste, now the most important thing to watch out for here is, last week with Chablis, we had a wine that was totally dry, whereas if you taste this, it's actually got some sweetness. It's agreeably sweet, I find, I think yeah. it's very refreshing. Now, of course, I think people do get terribly confused that you know, a dry wine has no sugar in it, a sweet wine has a lot of sugar in it. And of course, this in many markets would be described as being medium dry. But as you can taste, it, it isn't dry at all. What it means is it's got some sweetness, but it's not massively sweet. No, but it's um, very, very pleasant indeed. And 
I should make quite an important point here that Vouvray, particularly as sold in Britain, is usually in this medium style. It has a little bit of sweetness. They do make a dry version. They do make a sweet version. They even, believe it or not, make a sparkling version of Vouvray. So I always say to people, particularly if they're in a restaurant and they see Vouvray on a wine list, just to be careful and ask maybe the wine waiter which version it is. Yeah. OK. Um, with that s sort of medium sweetness, then we've got quite good fresh acidity. Again, this is the climate coming through. Nice sort of zip there. Moderate alcohol. It's got a lovely light-bodied texture. It's not one of those sledgehammer wines which sort of knocks the back of your head off when you taste it. And not a huge length of finish, but a nice sort of clean freshness. Do you agree with our master of wine? I think it's an extremely drinkable, extremely pleasant, cheerful wine. I think this is a really refreshing, good wine. It's the kind of wine sitting in the garden, pruning the roses and having a slurp of this, or listening to the cricket match or something of that <laughs> sort. It's a really refreshing, nice wine. The village of Vouvray is situated on the north bank of the Loire, just outside the city of Tours. And unlike many of the famous wine towns, you can drive through Vouvray without seeing a vineyard. The vineyards are actually tucked away in the hills above the village. Although the production of Vouvray is quite small, there is no place for the old-fashioned techniques. Vouvray, like the rest of France and the whole of the French wine industry, is well and truly in the 21st century. Computerized cooling, high-tech machinery, and stainless steel vats are now the order of the day. So how is the stuff actually made? Time to find JP, I think. That old JP walked up here. What a fool. I spent a little longer in the bar. He's so excited, he's up there in the vineyard, scrabbling away, looking at grapes, looking at earth and stuff like that. My job is to drag him out and explain to us how do you make white wine. Pedley, you're on. All right, Chief. We need you, we need you, because we all want to know how white wine is made. And it seems to me these are getting ready, at least, for picking. Yes, yes, yes. that's what I was doing down there, fondling them fondly. Um, at this time of year, we're about two or three weeks from harvest, and you can see down here, we're going to be picking those grapes very, very soon. And the first crucial thing is to get the grapes from the vineyard here to the winery as quickly as possible. And what they've got to do is get the juice out ASAP. And the way they do that is to, first of all, crush the grapes, just to break up the skin, and then press to release the juice. And this pressing is very, very important because, obviously, the gentler the pressing, the better the quality of the juice and the better the wine we're going to get. So, in fact, usually what they do is they press the grapes first of all and release the finest juice, what's called the first pressing juice, and then they release the press and they'll press perhaps for a second or a third time. And, of course, that juice isn't so fine. It's a bit like the old olive oil, you know, the, the best pressing is the, is the first pressing. So they've obtained the juice and that then goes into big stainless steel vats where it's fermented. And the reason that they ferment in stainless steel nowadays, and it's a very, very important thing in winemaking, is that they can control the temperature very easily. They rig it up with a thermostat, run cold water down the outside when the vat overheats, and that gives us a nice, steady, even fermentation. In terms of dry, medium or sweet wines, that can be controlled in the winery, and it's often done by when the fermentation takes place. Of course, if you just let the yeast run to the end of the fermentation, they'll turn all the sugar into alcohol, so you'd naturally have a dry wine. Of course, if you want some sweetness, if you stop the fermentation partway through, then you'll leave yourself with a bit of sweetness. That was brilliant, JP, right. I know there's lots of things you have to tell us over the next few weeks, so you pop back and carry on studying. I'm off to my hotel to study Loire cooking techniques. <laughs> Well, after all that techno talk, I thought I'd seek out a quiet spot by the river for a little relaxation. I've got some bread and some cheese. All I need is some nicely chilled wine. And where there's a will, there's a way. Wine should definitely not be over chilled. It spoils the flavor. But at other times, it's very disappointing how many times your wine isn't quite cool enough. Of course, there are many different ways of chilling wine and keeping them cold, like these little plastic jackets, for example. Then there are the terracotta or plastic tubes. I don't like them. I'm a traditionalist. What I really like is the classic 17th century solid silver urn filled with ice and water. You can't beat it. However, a little tip. If you are a bit short of ice, but you've got lots of water, a way to diffuse the coldness very quickly is to add some sea salt into the water. But then if you find yourself out in the countryside fishing, picnicking, there are other emergency ways you can employ to chill down wine. With just a towel wrapped around a bottle, soaking, soaking wet, and left in the sun to dry, you will get a chilled wine. 
And if all else fails, how about this? Well, you didn't expect me to keep fish in it, did you? They love cooking in the rich way with lots of butter, lots of wine, fruit, and fish, fresh water fish from the River Loire. Our first dish is a very simple maize fed chicken fried in lots of butter with little baby onions and simmered in pre fumé. So we leave that to simmer gently away for about half an hour or so, and down here, frying with Chop shallots, garlic, is some rabbit and the rabbit liver as well. And the first thing we have to do to that is tip in some eau de vie, some prune juice, some prune alcohol. Ah, lovely. Just to get the last flavors out of that. And then into that, we tip some red Anjou, another Loire wine. Also into that, we put a little tomato puree and some local prunes which have been marinated in red Anjou as well. Add to that a twig of thyme, a sprinkling of parsley, and we leave that just to simmer gently away for about 40 minutes. Here, a wonderful andouillette, the chitling and tripe sausage, has just been fried with onions, garlic, and carrots, and this is going to be simmered in Vouvray, a slightly sweet wine. And that, too, is going to have a load of parsley and allowed to simmer for about 40 minutes. Excellent. Now, back here, let's have a look at our sauce. The wine is reduced quite a lot. I'm going to add a little bit of lemon juice, a few mushrooms I've already cooked in butter. As I said, it's a very extravagant and rich dish, this. Not for the faint-hearted or those with a dietary problem. That's OK. Now we can lift out all of our little bits to one side for the moment because we have to make a rich sauce. And now, with this bright cream, we add over quite a low heat. Here I've whisked together some egg yolks, some cream and some fresh tarragon. And the reason this must be over a low heat is because if not, the egg yolk content will curdle. So this is just a small sample of the typical dishes you could expect to find when you visit the Loire. You might be offered grilled carp or zander or trout with beurre blanc, a little shallot and white wine and butter sauce. You might be offered andouillette stewed in vouvray with carrots, onions and parsley and garlic. Or corn-fed chicken cooked with mushrooms, cream, butter, onions and puits fumé. You might get rabbit or indeed even eels cooked in red Loire wine, Anjou red, with prunes. You must try the little local goat's cheeses, the grottons, they're called. They're absolutely delicious. And another very favourite starter around here, or a snack meal, is small fish in the river, dace, roach, rudd, things like that, simply dredged in flour and deep fried. No, I haven't run out of petrol. It's just that cycling is a really good way of burning off calories and seeing the sights of this wonderful region. Mind you, you can build up quite a thirst, I can tell you. I better find old JP. Now then, the vexed question of vintages. Vintage simply means the year in which the wine grapes were picked. That's all it means. Too many people think that vintage means good. But JP knows all about that. You're going to explain to us, JP, what is the difference? As you say, the, the most important thing to appreciate, as you say, is that vintage literally just means harvest. Nothing more, nothing less. And Growing grapes is just like growing any other crop. Farmers will tell you they had a good harvest one year and a bad harvest the next year. And in terms of the things that make a year particularly good, you probably have to say you need a fairly cold winter which kills off bugs in the vineyard. Also quite wet, gives a chance for the soil to soak up the moisture. Then, of course, uh, in the springtime, <laughs> You need mild conditions to get the growth off to a good start. And then during the summer, of course, you want it hot, dry, and sunny to get those grapes actually ripe. Uh, and then finally, the crunch time really comes at the vintage time, the harvest time in September, October, when you need fine weather so the grapes come in in healthy condition. So in other words, if you get all those things together, you're probably on for a good 
vintage. Well, from my limited experience, and I glance at the label, because I always think that is a very good thing to do, this 97 is pretty tickety-boo. Yeah, 97 was a year that overall was pretty good, so most of those factors I was describing came, came good in 97. If you want to try the next one along, that's a 93, and that would be a year that the weather wasn't so favourable. So when you try that, you'll see it's a pleasant wine, but... Oh, it's totally different. This, this, uh, the, this one is quite sweet. Yeah. Whereas this one, I think you'll see, is a leaner style. Leaner isn't it? style, wine speak that is. Um, it's not bad, but will it get better? Well, obviously, part of what we're looking at here is the way age is affecting a wine. But no, I think the answer is that the 97 has started with more concentration and richness, and it will end with more concentration and richness. It's the raw material you start with that's so important. But if you want to try a real magic one, just try the um, 1990 on the end there. Um, 1990 was a sensational year. It's a fantastic, sort of deep, almost sort of golden colour, isn't it? Mmm, that's liquid gold. I hope it's expensive, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And 1990 was a sensationally warm summer, fantastic autumn, massively ripe grapes, and hence the lovely sort of deep colour. And you just taste the richness on the flavour there. It's absolutely magnificent. I don't know how fashionable Vouvray sweet wine is, but I mean... I'd happily go for that instead of a poor quality Sauterne, quite Oh, frankly. yeah. Yeah, no, they're, gr they're great wines. And the lovely thing about this is these three wines that we've just uh, tasted are all from the same producer. They're literally from, if you like, the same field. So it's a nice illustration of how these wines, as I say, literally just down to the variation from one year to the next. The risk of being a train spot, you don't exactly want to walk around with a little card in your pocket that says 93 good, 87 bad, or whatever it is. Yeah. So if you don't know, how do you find out? Well, I suppose the formal way to do it would be to look it up in a magazine or a book, and you'll see these vintage charts which have almost like a league table of the top years. So you can do it that way. Um, but I often say, though, for for everyday wines, maybe the easiest thing is to think about the sort of summer that, that you've had. If it was a wretched summer when Wimbledon was rained off and when, you know, most of the test matches were a washout, there's a fair old chance that here in France they had a hopeless time as well. If it was a sensational summer that we all remember, then surprise, surprise, it's probably a year that made great wine. Brilliant. But, for me, at great cost, the classic year for Vouvray was 1945. Made two years after my birth, a pretty historic occasion, but it also celebrated the end of the Second World War. This, you're drinking history in happiness. It's magnificent. Anyway, enough of vintage, back to the present. For our next wine, the Puy Fumé, we need to travel east along the river to the village of Puy sur Loire. Although it's not the cheapest of wines, those of you with a bottle handy are not going to be disappointed. Encore une, s'il vous plaît. Voilà, monsieur. Merci beaucoup. So, JP, Puy Fumé. You are an old smoothie. Well, get on with the wine, <laughs> uh, dear fellow. As you say, Puy Fumé, very, very popular wine, I suppose, all around the world, particularly in Britain, along with its sister wine from the other side of the Loire, Sancerre. Now, if you remember last week, we were on the Chablis, which was, I suppose, the classic Chardonnay wine. So, with Sancerre and Puy Fumé, um, we've got, in effect, the classic Sauvignon wines. And people are probably aware Sauvignon's now grown almost everywhere in the world, um, particularly, obviously, New Zealand, some delicious Sauvignon. But with Puy Fumé and Sancerre, we're really dealing with the Benjamin <laughs> examples. <laughs> he says, there you are, dear boy. Thank you. It has arrived. Now, if you remember from last week, we had our process of tasting through, and we did a bit of revision earlier with the Vouvray. Yeah, um, you must realise, JP, there are probably 10 or 15 people scattered all over Britain at this moment on the edges of their seats, <laughs> desperate to drink. So could you <laughs> pracy this whole business, please? I, I shall do it with some celerity. Now, on the appearance, the first thing to look out for is this beautiful pale colour, bright, and I was saying earlier with the Vouvray, this greenish tinge because of the cool climate and the grape. In fact, very similar colour with Sauvignon wine. So you've got that sort of lovely, bright, almost sort of limey colour. Um, but very, very attractive. And then on the smell... Um, the smell? The great thing about Sauvignon Blanc is this pungent, sharp, grassy, leafy smell. I know this is terribly exciting, but <laughs> hold on, hold on, you can drink it in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> or now. Yes, that's right. No, I mean, the, the, 
Obviously, anyone who waits for me to finish to describing the smell would die of desiccation. But uh, as well as that, people often describe, they use this horrendous word, herbaceous. To, ah, uh, herbaceous border. <laughs> to describe that sort of tart freshness of the smell. And then on the taste. Ah, the taste is very good, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely bone dry. Big contrast from the Vouvre, which was medium. Um, so absolutely searingly dry. Very, very crisp acidity. Just a moderate amount of alcohol. And like all, really, the Loire wines, it has a delicious, light, delicate sort of flavour. It's absolutely ideal with fish, isn't it? You know, you can make a superb sauce. One of the famous sauces of the Loire Valley is called Beurre Blanc. You simply fry some very finely chopped shallots and a little butter, pour in some puy fumé, reduce that to almost nothing, and then whisk in little cubes of softened butter. You have a creamy, creamy sauce. It's a wonderful thing. And this wine also goes very well with the, with the fish from the region. I mean, the puy fumé is a classic with oysters, in my view. Yes. One thing, actually, we should say is that um, the Loire Valley, in the last few years, has had a fantastic run of vintages. Um, you know, uh, 97, 96, 95, all excellent all years. Good. You know, in many ways, um, the Loire has been going through an absolute golden age in the last few years. Um, so we could say to people, you know, it's never been a better time to taste these delicious white wines, you know. There are some sad people in this world who leave a half-finished bottle of wine and drink it again tomorrow. And they employ things like Christmas decorations to pop in there. They put in... Well, this one's OK, I suppose. It's got a bit of silver on it. And they've got this novel little device. Apparently, you put that in there and pump it. Yes, to extract the air, Extract the air. But really, I mean, do these work? Yes, I think, um, I mean, the basic message I would say to people is that with a white wine, which is a delicate style of wine, if you put the cork back in, keep it in the fridge overnight, it will probably keep reasonably well for maybe 24 hours, pushing it perhaps 36 hours. If you extract the air from the bottle with these sort of vacuum systems, then probably you're adding another day or so to the life of the wine. But as you say, you're, you're really pushing it. Well, and... I'm totally against these stoppers. There's only one way to look after a bottle, and that's to empty it. <laughs> well, I think it's time to move on. But I've enjoyed visiting this area. Puy-sur-Loire and Vouvray are both remarkably small places with such big wines, though. But the countryside around is absolutely stunning. The Loire Valley really is a tranquil, beautiful, green part of France, with its mix of agriculture and viniculture, its chateau, its fine wines, puy fumé and Vouvray and so on. It's a wonderful place. The food is excellent. But it's time to move on. Next week, we'll be tasting red Côte de Rhone Village and red Crozet Hermitage. So don't forget, get a few bottles and join us. Cheers.